Hey guys, so as some of you might be aware, this month is ShakeTube 2019. It's being hosted by the channels Old Blues Chapter and Verse, Steve Donahue, and Totally Pretentious. I'm going to be kind of semi-participating. I probably won't be joining in on any of the read-alongs, but I do want to participate. I'll be watching other people's channels and posting my own. So for starters, this video is going to be the first part in a top 10 series for me, for my top 10 plays. I figure that's probably the most basic place to start with, with these kind of videos. So this one is going to cover one honorable mention and then my, I guess, numbers 10 through 6 for favorite plays. I'm just going to give really quick descriptions for them or quick for me. And then each of the other plays in this list, so plays 5 through 1, will each get their own individual video that will go a little bit more in depth. This isn't going to be a full analysis, although there may be some analysis involved. I'm going to be focusing instead on kind of how this play has affected me and which parts I find particularly interesting and enjoyable. So, first off, we have our honorable mention, and that is Henry IV Part Two. So this play is definitely not one of my favorites in terms of just the overall plot. I honestly don't actually like a lot of it. Um, I know this is a pretty unpopular opinion, but I don't particularly like John Falstaff, and he's a very big part of this play. So that begs the question, why is it even an honorable mention on my top 10 list? The answer is the culmination of Prince Hal's arc in the final act of this play. At this point, we've had an entire play before this one, Henry IV Part I, to kind of build up to this point. So when we see his arc kind of come to fruition and we see him transform into Henry V, it's really, really satisfying. Also really sad. There's some very, very sad moments in that final segment. Actually, with John Falstaff, that's, that is one scene where I do feel legitimately bad for him. But, yeah, it's... That final segment is enough to make me actually really like this play. I just don't like the other parts of it. And now on to the actual top 10. So at number 10, I have Richard II. This one has amazing poetry, and it's a really, really interesting start out to the Henriad, which is the um, first tetralogy of Shakespeare's plays. So Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V. They're all kind of sequels to each other. And... Richard II, it really, really sets this in motion. You can feel the events that, that happen in this play ages later. Even in the next set of four of four history plays, Henry, the, which is the Henry VI plays and Richard III, you're still feeling the repercussions. Those events wouldn't be happening if it weren't for what happens in this play. So yeah, really, really super important. Very well written plays. The, the actual wordplay in, in this story is really, really interesting, particularly the use of names and titles, because... Yeah, the way that Henry Bolingbroke and Richard II relate to each other and how they relate to other people, the names that are used for them are quite, quite indicative of how they're feeling or how people are feeling towards them. Also, John of Gaunt is amazing, and if you watch The Hollow Crown, he's played by Patrick Stewart. So, And number nine, we have Julius Caesar. This one has fascinating character dynamics, particularly around the character of Brutus. Julius Caesar has a surprisingly small role for, for a title character, although... Cymbeline, that really shouldn't be a surprise given, yeah, Cymbeline, like I said, but that's beside the point. But despite the fact that he's not actually in the story as much as you might expect, his presence is vital to what happens in this play and how it affects all the other characters. And just seeing the way Cassius, Brutus, and Mark Antony react to the events surrounding Caesar are really, really interesting, particularly how they react to each other. And also, just some of the speeches in this play are fabulous. And at number eight, we have Much Ado About Nothing. This is one of my favorite comedies. It has probably one of my favorite Shakespeare couples. I love the dynamic between Beatrice and Benedict, how they're constantly verbally sparring with each other, and you can they you can tell they definitely see each other as kind of a, a way to sharpen their wit, but it works really, really well, particularly when they do actually team up together. Also, I love how it's, how it's like, how are you two so amazing in all these other things, but you're terrible at writing love poetry. But it, it makes sense. It's just it's really funny. For number seven, we have Romeo and Juliet. This one, I tend to kind of waffle back and forth a lot for my opinion on this one, mostly because it's a beautifully written play and its themes are absolutely incredible, especially since it's, yeah, love is definitely a dominant theme in this play, but I would say that another dominant theme is revenge and the damage that revenge can cause. Like, that's a huge one. That's where most of the conflict from this play actually comes. That being said, I do have a hard time at times not finding the two main characters slightly irritating and how impulsive they are and how much damage their actions do cause. However, the fact that this play draws me in despite that 
it kind of says a lot about about it and it does earn a lot of respect from me and again the wordplay is incredible i know i'm gonna you're gonna hear that a lot because you know shakespeare but it's very very well done in this play i especially like that romeo and juliet's first conversation is a sonnet if you look at it it's which i find is really cute last but not least at least for this video we have number six which is macbeth the tragedy with the happy ending so this play is so dark at times, but I kind of love it. And there's one scene where Macbeth's like doorkeeper or porter goes to answer the door and it's like he's just this single one-off character, but the speech is absolutely hilarious. It's like how is it that this tragedy has so much comedy in it? But despite that, the actual tragedy itself is really, really interesting, particularly watching how Macbeth and Lady Macbeth interact with each other, how they kind of almost switch places at times, despite kind of starting off with one of them being extremely ruthless and the other being much more hesitant and then they end up changing places over time and seeing what it does to their psyche and kind of how they react especially like there's one scene where they've just committed a an act that i'm a horrible act that i'm not going to describe because i don't want to give away too much if you haven't read the play but the way shakespeare writes their dialogue it creates this very kind of sporadic sharp way of talking that is how someone would actually talk in this in, in this environment in this situation but because he's using the verse lines it works really really well and it does actually convey how he wants this delivered which that is something shakespeare does with all of his work but it works really well in this moment in particular also malcolm is awesome and i love him so that's going to be everything for this particular video the next one should be coming out probably next week i might make it a little bit sooner all depending anyway if you guys have any comments on any of these plays or anything else feel free to comment down below and i will see you all later have a nice day. Bye-bye.